Hi, this is Nancy at Civic and Painting Hamden in Denver. I'm going to paint, teach you how to paint this beautiful painting today. It's called Majestic Moonlight. And um, when we paint from the paintings in our gallery here at the studio, we use primary colors and then we mix them to approximate the colors that are in our paintings. We have about 500 different paintings here and each one has been painted over the years by our various artists. And so they may have used slightly different paints, but we're gonna teach you how to mix with your primary colors. So I have red, blue, white, black, and yellow. I also have an apron on, you need an apron. I have three brushes. I have a large, medium, and small brush. You can use whatever brushes you have available. And I also have napkins. I'm painting on a 16 by 20 canvas. Uh, it's, it's nice for me to use a big one so that I can really show you the steps, but you don't have to paint on something this big. I also have my water jar. And I have a beverage for myself. I always recommend a glass of wine if you can, when you paint, if you're old enough. And let's get started, shall we? All right, so this is my canvas. I'm going to, first thing I'm gonna do, see this moon? I'm gonna paint a white circle and I'm gonna start in the center, go around, round and get bigger, get bigger until you have about the size of a small melon or a large softball. Somewhere in between. It's not as big as a volleyball or a bowling ball even. I would say a small melon. Bigger than a grapefruit. And that's this, okay? And I, I'm putting it uh, at eye level on the painting, what I call eye level, but it's above the horizon line, right? Horizon line's gonna be down here. Um, closer to the top, about a loose hands width from the top maybe. You can have yours a little higher, a little lower, it doesn't really matter. So just plain old white, start in the center and circle up. Just circle up. That's it. Okay, so that's the first thing we do. Then we're going to make pink to go around. Actually, uh, let's start with a little orange. So slightly orange. Okay, more like a salmon color. We're going to start with salmon color. So I have my paints. I'm going to pull aside some red, red paint. I'm gonna pick up a little white. Now I don't go into the center of my paint. When I am mixing, I pull some from a side so I don't contaminate the inside of it. And then you see that I'm making this beautiful pink color, kind of Pepto-Bismol-y, which is right on, that's what I want. And then I'm gonna pull in just a little bit of yellow because I want this to be more like salmon on this first circle near the sun. Now again, my painting is not going to be exactly like the sample, remember, and yours isn't either, but it's going to be beautiful, I promise you. Okay, so what I'm getting is this kind of salmon color. Can you see that? Okay. And I'm just going to pick that up with my big brush, and I'm going to go around the melon. And go back and forth. All right. Okay, nice. Now we're going to make a stronger pink. After that, I'm going to pick up my palette, pick up a little white, pick up a little red. See, I'm pulling it from a different spot on my palette. My palette is a paper plate. We're that fancy around here. All right, and you see I'm mixing some pink. The first one was kind of salmon, but now we're gonna go into our pink. So it's red and white together makes pink. All right, and then once I've got it mixed, I'm gonna put it on both sides of my brush. Both sides of my brush. And I might, I'm going to need to mix a little bit more. There's a bug on my canvas. All right. See how that nice contrast, first the salmon and then the pink? That's pretty, huh? All right. So far, so good.
And the line between the salmon and the pink, if your brush is mostly dry because you just put all that paint on there and now you have a dry brush, great. Take that dry brush, that dry, slightly unclean brush, and go over that edge where the pink and the salmon meet. And if you do that really softly and really carefully, then you won't be able to tell where the salmon started, that orangey color, pale orange, and where it stopped and where the pink started. That's, that's the key to blending. You want to do that when both of them are a little wet. Okay. In between each color, if I go back to my white to, you know, smooth, make it a little more round or something, I want to clean my brush really well. Make sure you always clean your brush in between and go really carefully. If you go back in the, there to make that white a little rounder after you put on the color, go really slow and careful and just repeat that step, slow and careful. Now you can have these rings around it and that's actually really cool because what that does is that creates this kind of echo effect and around the moon, echo of light. And that's actually a great thing. That's not a bad thing, that's a great thing. Because when you look up at a light, like let's say you look at a lamppost in the city, you'll see kind of rings around it. Um, that's how your eye perceives it. They may not really be there, I'm not sure. Um, that's how we perceive it, so how would we know? Okay. So far, so good. If you don't like the rings in your white though, clean your brush and then you can always come back in and make your white brighter. You can always do that, no problem. Catch any drips quickly with a napkin, just super gently, super gently. And then make sure you dab your, your brush better the next time. And then I'm gonna pick up that same color and just try to fix that by going over it again. Down here, a little pink. And then around to fix it. Okay, we're doing great folks, we're doing great. All right, so I want this to really pop more and be more vibrant. So now with that pink that I did, I'm gonna add a little more red. So I have that pink on my palette. Now I'm just gonna add a little more red to it. It's, I still need to have some white, but it's, this is gonna have more red. It's gonna be a deeper pink. So, so red, it's, this pink is almost red. And then I'm gonna take that and go around. Notice how that just pops. That really wakes up the painting, doesn't it? And that's what we want. Just wake it right up. Good morning, painting. I'm gonna mix a little bit more red in while you mix yours. So basically, just to recap, we started with our spritzing our canvas with water, and then we put on our white circle about the size of a, a small melon. Then we made a salmon color using red and white and a tiny bit of yellow, just like a pastel orange uh, or salmon. That was our first ring. Our second ring was red mixed with white to make that lighter pink. And now this next step, and I'm still on the same step, I'm just going around more, just making it wider, is a darker pink. Notice how the colors are getting more vibrant as I go out, more vibrant. All right, I'm going to just finish up this ring and then I'm gonna let you catch up because I figured you're probably not caught up with me and that's okay. The beauty of having a Zoom class or a YouTube class is that you can revisit this recording tomorrow and you can catch up. But in the meantime, I'm going to just 
put a little bit more ring around this and then I'm going to stop and let you catch up. Painting circles like this is so relaxing. Very zen like. All right, so I'm going to stop there, let you catch up. And then you can start to wonder what our next color will be. So if, you're, if you're, uh, your colors look too much like a target, dampen your brush with a little bit of water. Knock off any drips. And then come in and slowly circle out from that first ring. Just circle out really slowly. My paint is still a little bit wet. And because my brush is damp, it's letting me blend. So anytime I want to blend colors together, I just make sure that I have a damp brush and the paint colors are still a little bit wet. Now let me tell you about, in general, I have uh, customers all the time or uh, students who tell me that they use a ton of napkins when they paint with acrylic paint. And you don't need to use a lot of napkins. Basically, let your water do the work. Do all your swishing in the water. Your brush will come out clean, even if your water is not clean. Even if it's not clean, your water, your brush will come out mostly clean. And then I dab that remaining water off of my brush onto the side of the container. And then I use my napkin just to test it. See, there's, it's got a tiny bit of pink, but it's mostly clean. So you don't have to use 10,000 napkins. Just uh, let the water do the work. All right, so blending again. I have a clean brush. I, my brush is damp. The paint still is a tiny bit wet. So by just going between those colors where the two meet and going over that line, it just blends them all together. Now it's harder to know where that color started and the next one stopped. And the last one stopped. So if you have any border that you want to just smooth and make it very gradual, do that trick. Put a drop or two of water on your brush and just go around and around. All right. So the next color we're going to use is we're going to use purple. And <clears throat> purple, don't know if you know this, purple is red and blue mixed together. So where my red and blue are together near each other, I'm just going to mix them into a new spot. Now again, I'm not going into the middle of my red or the middle of my blue because I want to leave those clean in case I need them for something else. But I'm going to swirl those together, some red and blue, to make purple. Now depending on the kind of paint that you use and the exact shade, your purple will vary. Results may vary, right? So I've got a really dark purple going on here. If I want it to be lighter, I'm going to pick up some white. And I'm going to mix that in, see what I get. Probably put in too much white. That's, you know, trial and error. That's how these things go. Stir, 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 and you do yours. A little white, some red, some blue. It's not uncommon for the blue to be the strongest pigment. If blue has phthalo in it, which is a kind of blue, the blue just takes right over. But depending on what kind of blue you're using, that you'll have to see with your own paints that you're using. Now, 
I did put in too much white, so silly me. Using a lot more blue and red to accomplish what I wanted. I could have put in less white and not had to make so much, but you know, that's all right. If you, do, if you are doing this and you find you're just adding more and more paint, start fresh. Don't, don't waste any more, just start fresh. And sometimes that's the, that's the key. All right, so I think, I think I'm getting close here. And hopefully this will be a purple I can live with. We'll see. We'll see. All right. And we have purple. It's not a bright, brilliant purple, but I can live with it. I'm going to put it on both sides of my big brush all along. I've just been using my big brush. And this is the next ring. And we have just made this giant target, haven't we? Around and around we go. And mine has just taken me right off to the sides of the canvas and I'm okay with that. And if you want to paint the sides, you can just go right off onto the sides and the top and the bottom and just carry that painting all the way around. And then you won't need to put it in the frame. That is called a gallery rack. All right, so I've got my purple in this big old circle around and round. And I'm going to clean my brush. And I, the reason I clean my brush is now it's remember it's a little damp and this is still a little wet. So I'm going to go where that red or that pink starts with the purple. And I just want to blend that area where they meet a little bit more. Just going around and around so it's not so obvious where the purple starts. Not so obvious. Whew. Right on out, right on out. Then in these corners, we're just going to use straight on blue. I'm just going to, this is easy, straight on blue in those corners. Now, if you have a different paint set at home and you have a pale orange that you can mix with white to get that salmon, if you have purple, then great, you're ahead of the game. But if all you have are primary colors and black and white, you can mix just about anything under the rainbow. Now you can't mix fluorescent colors. And this has a little fluorescent in it, I think, um, the original. But like I said, we have about 500 different paintings here. And we, on our YouTube classes, we in our Zoom classes, we recreate them to the best of our ability using the primary colors so that you can learn how to mix paints. And we come pretty close, pretty close. We're happy with the results and I hope you are too. Remember, no one's ever going to see the original, never. They're just going to see yours hanging in your home and they're going to think you're a genius. All right. So now on this bottom, uh, I'm going to in this area here, I'm going to put in some blue right here, like an angle, just like I did up there next to the purple. Just to kind of make a corner there. Same thing over here. Same thing over here. I'm painting the sides as I go. Uh, 
I'm going to stop after I get much farther and then I'm going to let you catch up. So don't worry, don't panic. All right, and then I'm going to end up cutting off some of this for my horizon line. So about a wide hand, hand uh, open your hand, not completely wide, but mostly. And then I'm going to make a horizon line right there. Yep, there's your bravery test. And I'm gonna paint over what I have. I'm just gonna paint right over it. And if some of that purple's shining through in the middle, great. That makes a reflection, that's a good thing. All right, I don't even have to work that in, I can just let it be. And then I'm gonna cover the bottom, and then I'm gonna take a break and let you catch up. And this is just straight on blue at the bottom. That's all it is, just blue. My canvas is making a pretty silly little sound. I don't know why that's never happened before. It's kind of making me laugh. A little crinkly sound, which I've never heard before. All right. And then I'm gonna paint the sides. So it looks like the painting just goes right around the corner. Boop. Remember that gallery wrap. Now, later when it's dry, I'm gonna paint the bottom of this canvas too. If I pick it up now to paint the bottom, I'm gonna be a sticky mess. So I'm gonna just let that dry a bit. All right. So I'm gonna let this dry while you catch up. All right. So, I'm gonna step back, let it dry, you're gonna catch up, and then when I come back, we'll go from there. I wanna just tell you how to know when your painting is wet or dry. My painting is still very wet, but I wanna show you the difference, okay? So, when you're looking at your painting, if it shimmers like a record album for those old people, or like shiny plastic or vinyl, if you're younger and can relate to that. See how this part, the blue is very shiny, but in the center it's matte, meaning it's, it's not shiny. You can see that, this is all dry, I can touch this. This is very wet. So we wanna look at it in different light and then make sure that it's matte, not shiny, before we paint anything over it. If you are waiting for paint to dry, uh, if there's anything you need to tweak, now is the time to do it. I can take my medium brush. I can add a little bit of water to a tiny bit of white paint, just so it's very watered down white paint. If I need to go over any harsh lines in the center of my white or make it smoother. Oh, goodness, there's some black on there. How'd that happen? No worries. Happy accidents, right? If you do something, that you don't like, two ways. You can very softly with a clean napkin just kind of tap and absorb. It's a little risky way, but it does work. Pull it up and just kind of tap and absorb. Because acrylic made, paint is made out of water and pigment and plastic and a little glue. Acrylic needs plastic, right? A kind of plastic. So, you can dab with a clean napkin uh, or you can let it dry and once it's dry go over it with white paint and when i was a kid we had typewriters that's how old i am and uh we used typewriter in high school not not a computer they it, computers existed back then but we not everyone had one they were still pretty new so anyway Enough of me telling you how old I am. But in general, uh, we used to use this stuff called correction fluid, which you still see in the stores. And it's basically, or whiteout, call it whiteout maybe. When you're writing a letter or you're typing something or maybe you're addressing an envelope or something, you use correction fluid and you can write right over it. So you can use acrylic paint the same way. Just let it dry, go over it, 
with correction fluid, no, I mean with white paint, let it dry and then paint over that. Now this is still very wet, so I can wait or I can wave it around. That's another way I can do it. Or I can put it in front of a fan or I can put it in front of a blow dryer. It's easy and fast to just wave it around and then you don't have to put away your fan or your blow dryer, but whatever is easiest for you. And that will speed up the process. So I've got to let that dry a bit. There's really nothing I can do in the meantime. Yeah, there is. Let me show you. Here's a step we can do while that's drying. This whole inner part is dry. So what I can do, this painting has stars in the sky. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my little brush, any, any brush will do, and I'm going to paint with a stick. I'm putting the stick in white paint. See that? Just putting it in white paint. And then with the stick, I'm going to come up into the pink or the purple, whatever you like, and I'm going to touch and slightly twist a quarter turn to have that paint release, and I'm making stars. If I don't twist it, this, I can still make stars, but they're smaller and not quite as round. So the twist, quarter turn of a twist, that, that helps make it a little rounder. Or even, not even a quarter turn, it's just a tiny bit. Just twist a tiny bit, and that helps you make it round and it comes off better. So while my blue is drying, I can go into all the other colors and I can do this. And I can just make stars because this painting has a lot of beautiful twinkling stars around this beautiful. I don't know if it's a setting sun or a rising moon. What do you think? You tell me. But whatever it is, it's going to have some beautiful stars. And I can do that. I can do that while I'm letting the blue dry. Put as many or as few as you want. But here's the thing. Put some close together and some far apart. You don't want it to look like you're playing dots. You want it to look more random. So anytime your blue is dry, go ahead and pop some on where the blue is dry. And this painting is going to have them all over right above the horizon. There's going to be stars all over. Why not? Put as many or as few as you want, as close to the sun or moon, whatever that is. I think it's a moon. That's my take. But sometimes the setting sun looks like a rising, no, the setting, yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. All right. Like I said, when the blue dries more, you can pop stars onto that as well. And the blue in the darker areas really pops, or the, the white dots in the darker areas really pop. I tend to overdo everything. You don't have to put on this many stars. You decide, your world, you decide. I figure go big or go home. Why not? Now my blue down here is still a little bit shiny. So I can wait for that, no problem. Or I can just start to show you the next step and only go on the dry areas. So I'm gonna do that. Basically what I wanna show you here is see how these white lines are kind of scribbled, but carefully straight across in, and that reflects the light above it. So I'm going to take a little white on my brush and I'm going to, I'm going to dab my ba a very small brush into the white and I'm going to twist it on the plate. 
because I want to chisel that to a finer point. I want it to be a fine point. And then I'm going to carefully pull some white lines across. Now, if your paint is super, super wet, you're just gonna make light blue. You do wanna have white in this though. So mine's starting to dry, so I can do this in the dry spots so that I do have white. But where I don't, it'll be a little light blue and there's nothing wrong with that, that's okay. That's all right. I just don't wanna make the whole thing light blue. I want these dark areas to stay dark. So the sun, or the moon rather, is reflecting down and these colors are also reflecting down. So I'm gonna put a little more white right about down here and I'll tell you why. Because I want that moon to be reflected a little bit more down there. Because up here, I'm gonna put in the salmon color a little bit, right underneath it, just a little bit, just a tiny bit. Not too much, don't overdo this. Oop, I might have already done it. Okay, there's the salmon. If I overdo it, let it dry and just paint white over it and then repeat. Redo the whole area. We can do that. And then uh, remember I had pink. I can, a little higher than that, I'm gonna have pink because then it's this reflection. Pretty, a little pink in there, right? And then as I get up higher, it's gonna be red because it's reflecting in the same order I'm looking at it. I hope that makes sense. It's a mirror. This one didn't really do a mirror, but I like to be a little more logical. You do you. Any reflections with these basic colors in there, it's gonna look really pretty. And then uh, this purple, can't forget the purple. And that's gonna reflect, you know, a little closer to the sides because that's where it exists on the painting. So, all right, see how cool that is? Now my, my streaks aren't exactly like their streaks, who cares, it doesn't matter. I said that, who, who cares, like somebody on TV, I don't know. Who cares, forget about it. Lots of pretty colors in this. You want your stripes to go out a little farther? Pull them out. Put them in a little, little farther. You do you. You make your painting just the way you want. Like I said, no one's ever going to see the original of this painting. They're just going to see yours. And they're going to think you're a genius. You say, oh my goodness, how did you know how to do that? That's beautiful. And you just make up, well, I thought about it. I just, it came to me one day. I had a genius moment. Isn't that pretty? It's one of my favorite paintings here. We have 500 paintings here, but I like this one a lot. This is a, this is a popular one it's called Majestic Moonlight. All right, so there's the reflection. For some reason, when I look in the camera, it looks a little bare here, so. Now, I looked in the camera to see what I'm seeing, to see what you're seeing, but you should probably do exactly what, here's, here's what I recommend to all my students at, this, at Sabine Painting Hamden. When you're painting, you're staring at the same thing for a really long time and it gets really dull and you start to get frustrated and you can't really see what you're doing. You can't see, um, you can't see your painting for the beautiful painting that it really is. So what I recommend is that you walk away about 10 to 15 feet. That's where you're gonna be seeing your painting once it's hanging on a wall, right? If you give it as a gift, that's where someone else will be looking at it. 
um, or if it's hanging in your home, you'll, you, you won't be putting your nose in it and looking up close like we're painting. You're gonna be standing back 10 or 15 feet away. So always while you're painting, step back, step back and look at it from 10 to 15 feet away and see what you actually have. Because then you'll know, you'll come back and you'll say, ah, oh, I know what to tweak now. Or it's perfect just the way it is. I don't wanna to touch anything. So before I step back, and I am gonna step back and look at my own, this looks a tiny bit darker right in here. Maybe, I don't know. Let's just see. We'll see when I step back. Cause you know what, what I see now, I can't see from this distance. All right, now I'm 15 feet away and I can see what I'm doing. And what I'm seeing is that my moon is not as diffuse as the original. So, now that I stepped back and I saw what I did, I can tweak. But you can't do that from up close because you can't really see it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a little bit more white around here because I want my moon to be a little more diffuse. I don't want it to look like somebody threw a snowball and plop it stuck. I want it to look like there's some rings around it. And from a distance, it didn't look like I had any rings around this. So this just kind of breaks it up and I think it adds a nice flow. The original has more of a glow to it. Like I said, I couldn't see that from close up. More glow. So if you haven't gotten up and looked at your painting, I'm telling you, get up. That's what all the good artists do. They, they take breaks and they look at it from a different perspective and then they come back to it. The masters in Europe, when they were painting the masterpieces that are really famous, boy, they would take months to paint a painting because they would look at it the next day and rethink the concept and, oh, we're trying to get something done in two hours. The least we can do is step away, right? All right, so we have our stars. Well, we have the beautiful moon with all of the glowing, uh, magic around it we have the stars and we don't have any birds yet and we don't have trees so i like to do my birds last and i'm going to go ahead and start with the trees actually i'm going to give you a minute to finish your your streaks just thank you a minute to do that. Okay, so all we have left now is our trees. All right, this is fun, right? Beautiful. Okay, so for my trees, I'm gonna take a medium brush. And in my case, it's a medium flat. Depending on what kind of brushes you have, you're gonna to have to make a judgment call here. 
If you have a medium round, that could probably also work, but let me show you the technique first. I'm putting black paint on both sides of my medium brush. Uh, it's not a scoop, not like ice cream. Just covering the bristles with it. They're fully coated, so I'm dabbing quite a few times. They're fully coated, but there's loaded, but there's no huge clumps. And for these, these side trees, they're tallest. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pop on a trunk. Why am I popping and not dragging? I'll tell you. Because pine trees have this variegated, kind of like a knife or serrated, um, choppy kind of bark. And so the best way to really show that is to pop on a trunk rather than slide your brush down and making a straight line like a telephone pole. So this way, it's not a perfect line. Nature is never perfect. Palm trees are a little, you know, they're not perfectly straight and they have this bumpy texture trunk. So if I do that, I'm ahead of the game. And I'm gonna drop down, watch my hand, I'm gonna drop down about a half an inch. And at the top, I'm gonna to just dab back and forth on both sides, see that? Just a little bit, just a little bit, let's see. Just a little bit. A little bit on each side to get those baby branches. I'm holding my brush perfectly flat. My hand, my shoulder is doing all the work. I'm keeping the brush still. But as I go down, each, each row of branches, I'm dropping down a little bit and then tapping, tapping, tapping across. Now, I don't want it to be exactly perfectly across and I might put some extra ones on the left or some extra ones on the right because I don't want it to look too symmetrical. I don't want this to look like a ladder. So what I don't want to do, watch this, don't do this, okay, don't do that. Just go straight across. Unless you're trying to do a tree that does all that. Now, depending on where you live, your trees, your pine trees might all do that. I'm tapping in to cover up some of those spaces. I don't want the tree to look symmetrical and perfect. If it looks symmetrical and perfect, it'll look like Disney World. And we don't want Disney World. We want it, or a ladder. We want it to be a little imperfect. So maybe some of the branches are gonna stick out a little more or a little less. And Maybe some are closer together and they, they're right up next to each other. Maybe some are farther apart. Maybe, maybe there's even a gap. Maybe a bear was climbing that tree and there's a gap, maybe. Maybe broke a branch, maybe, maybe a kid did. Maybe there was hail, we don't know. Anyway, you want it to be wider at the base. So it's like a triangle shape. Okay, and I'm just holding my brush flat the whole time and letting my shoulder do all the work. And I can tap over the trunk area for more fullness. If I see too much of the trunk, I'll just tap over it. And the reason I wanna do that is because when you're painting a tree two-dimensionally, you have the branches on this side, you have branches on the other side, but then those ones that come forward and behind, you don't have a way of painting those on a two-dimensional painting. So by painting, tapping in some thickness over the trunk, that's what you're putting on. So there's tree number one. Same thing over here. I have that one trunk, right? Start at the branch, drop down a half of an inch because you always want a straight up point on your tip of your tree. Your eye will say, ah, your brain will say, oh, that must be a pine tree, it has a point. That's where the trunk has grown before any branches have sprouted out up there. And then I'm dropping down, dropping down. If anyone has ever repelled before, it's the same motion. You drop down a little bit as you go out. Now I don't want it to be too zigzag. So if you're starting to see zigzag, straighten it out. But I also wanna make sure that I leave some, 
uh, spaces between the branches because I don't want the birds to die. I don't want them to drive to fly into a brick wall. I want to leave space for my birds to have a place to build the nest. So when I'm here in the studio, I tell my my students, if you if you uh, paint your branches too close together and then it looks like a a black ice cream cone standing on its you know standing on the table where are your birds going to fly in and build a nest you got to leave some spaces right and then i'm also going to carry that over where it makes sense on the side we've got a tree here i got a tree here now there's three more on this side there's two more on this side and they get smaller as they go in. So each one's gonna get a little smaller as they go in. Boom, boom, boom. Remember, tap, 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 not drag. You can also use a fan brush for this. So if you own a fan brush, I'm gonna, let's see if I have one. Mm, nothing handy here. I'm gonna do a couple more like this and then I think I'm maybe gonna grab a fan brush so I can show you how to do it with fan brush. Fan brushes are so fun. You don't need to have a fan brush. You, you can do it just like this. But fan brushes are also fun. There's a little kid that comes in and paints in our studio. He's adorable. And he is really a committed painter and works so hard and is doing great. It's only about six years old. Just really a doll. He's going to be an amazing painter. Uh, and I was telling him, for your birthday, you got to ask your parents for a fan brush because Fan brushes are the bomb. All right, I put a go out there. Oops, maybe that's a bird's nest. Okay, and I'm gonna do one more on this side, and then I'm gonna go grab a fan brush so I can show you how cool a fan brush is. Now I put that one a little bit too close to the next tree. <laughs> oh well, right? Happy accidents, happy accidents. So maybe I'll make this one a little bit skinny. I want I don't want them to blend in completely with that one. I want it to look like there's a tree there. Maybe I'll make them taller. That's how we'll know. All right. I'm gonna go grab a fan brush and I'm gonna finish up my trees with a fan brush just to show you. Why not? A little extra. Now, notice how I'm painting all the way down to the base of this water. Why would I do that? That's crazy, right? No, it's not. When you see pine trees that have a stump at the bottom, that's because someone cut off the bottom branches. Because real pine trees grow, they, they sprout up a little bit on, a, on their trunk and then they, they start to sprout branches pretty soon after. And so the grass grows up to the bottom of the pine tree in a mountain or in the mountains or in the parks. And by the time it's cut down as a Christmas tree, people have taken off the bottom branches so they can cut it down. Or if you see it in a city park, they cut out the brown branches so they can mow underneath. So if you bring your branches all the way down and not leave a stump at the bottom, it's gonna look more natural. It's gonna look like you're out in the woods. So while you're doing that, I'm gonna go grab a fan brush so I can show you about those. Okay, so here's my good friend fan brush. Do you see how it looks like a fan or a rake? And the way it works, I coat the paint. I just rake into my paint. And then I knock off any clumps. Always make sure your paint is thin enough that you don't have big clumps when you pick it up. I have it on my brush, but see there's no clumps. It's just the bristles are coated. I like to make sure that my paint is about the consistency of motor oil. If it's Vaseline or 
peanut butter or pudding, it's too thick. It needs to be like Hershey syrup, no, not, yeah, like Hershey syrup or maple syrup or motor oil, that kind of a thick liquid rather than a solid, a soft solid. All right, so two trees here, I have two here. I'm gonna make another one over here. It's gonna be a little smaller, right? Because I'm going smaller as I go. And let's see, another one right about here. Boop, boop, boop. Might as well just lay in the trunks, right? And then I got one kind of off center, right about here, a little baby. Hello, how are you? You don't have to have the exact same number of trees I do. You can have more or fewer, it's your call. So I'm gonna drop down a half an inch, remember, and now when I use the fan brush, but hold it flat, see that? Flat. And I'm only gonna use the corner right here for those little tiny baby brush, baby branches at the top. They just require the corner. But notice how I'm holding my brush to get those little corners? It's almost parallel to the canvas. You see that, how I'm holding it? Now as I go down, I have to use more of this brush. Still holding it flat, but I'm gonna to have to use more, so I have to rotate it. Still holding it flat. Still holding it flat. See how flat I'm holding it? I like to pretend there's a guy sitting on it, and if I curve my brush at a diagonal, he's gonna fall off. A guy or a gal, you tell me. And then I'm gonna pop over the trunk. If I can see the trunk, I'm gonna pop over it for a little fullness over the trunk. Now see, it's a little different look with the fan brush. A little more exact than using a different kind of a medium flat, a flat brush. So you can tell I'm infatuated with fan brushes. I love these guys. They're also great for making grasses and hair on animals. Um, fan brushes are the bomb. They're great for blending. When we were blending, I'm not going to touch this paint. When we were blending all this, a fan brush is great for that. But I don't expect anyone to have a fan brush in their basic kit, right? That's why we start with a basic kit. Just the most basic brushes, the most basic paints. And then later, as you get some experience and you start to acquire new tools get a fan brush and you can have a great time with your fan brush they come in all different sizes too i used to have a big one here i don't know what happened to it all right how's that i think we have an almost finished painting so what i'm going to do is i'm going to clean off my fan brush always cleaning these brushes. You just can't clean them enough because once they get paint dried on them, they, they, it ruins a brush really. So you just want to keep, keep cleaning. I'm going to make a few little birds like that. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to take my baby brush and I'm going to dip it in the black paint and I'm going to spin it to chisel it to a finer point. If you have a teeny tiny brush, then you're, you're ahead of the game, right? And then We'll see if mine can be anywhere near as good as those. I don't know. Tap and pull. Oops. Kind of lost my wing there. Okay. Real carefully pull. But as you let up on the pull, it's far, you're, you're putting more pressure when you start and then let up. And that's what creates it thinner at the, as you go up. So it's just a V, but you let go. So tap and then, oops, let go too early. Let go. Sometimes you gotta do it again. Let go. Oh man, I'm having a hard time. Let go. Told ya, these are good. This one's gonna be a big bird. You're a big boy. It's all right. Um, there you go. He's just a big boy. That's okay. Big boys are loud. That one's a teeny tiny one. They must use a little brush on that guy. I don't have a tiny, tiny brush handy, so I'm going to just be careful. Mine might be bigger. Oh, yeah, well. Yeah, let go. 
Yeah. There we go. Got some birds. Oh, hey, you know what I forgot? Take a look at my painting. And, and notice there's something very different about this painting than this one. See if you can spot it. Can you spot it? If you can't spot it, look at the trees and look at the water. This one has reflections in the water of the trees. Let me show you up close. Do you see that? See these little reflections? They're very thin. They're just kind of scribbled on. They're very, very thin. So there's a couple different ways you could do those. I put my baby brush in the water, but I didn't, I didn't clean it. Mine's still a little bit dirty. So if I wanted, I could just kind of scribble on some lines in the opposite shape of what's above it. So wider at the top and then down, but I'm not zigzagging, I'm lifting up. It's just one line, one line, one line, one line. But the, and it's with less paint because I didn't clean my brush, but I did dip it in the water. So now there's less paint. Reflections always have less color or shade than what they're reflecting. I also wanna make sure that since this is a bigger tree, that the reflection is bigger and goes down farther because it's gonna be the mirror image of that, but lighter. Same thing over here. And all I need is a line. I don't have to go back in. I could use my fan brush if I wanted and, and do the opposite, do the same thing ups, upside down. But I like these straight lines because water moves. And where water moves, you get the reflect, it pulls the reflection with it. So the straight lines work, okay? So I've got, let's see, this one's a little weak. All right, but the key is water down your paint. And so it's, you're not really putting that much paint on it. Let me show you. You see, it's real faint. That's what we're going for, real faint. Lines going across, real faint. Okay, same thing here. This one's gonna not go down so far because it's just a little baby tree. And it's gonna be kind of the reverse image and I won't go down as far, maybe a little bit further, okay? And we're gonna keep going. This one's gonna go down a little bit farther. It's a little wider to start because it's a big sister, big brother tree. All right, we got mama, daddy coming up. Maybe it's two daddies, two mommies, we don't know. Maybe it's aunts, maybe it's a babysitter, or nanny, we don't know. Boom, boom, boom. This one's gonna go all the way down because it's a grown-up tree. And this one, ooh, hello there, Big Daddy. All right, there we go. Oh, I didn't make it skinnier. I was getting carried away. Anyway, that's it. That's it, we're done. So now I'm going to just clean off my brush and I can sign my painting anywhere. Let's see, all right. This one doesn't have a signature. <laughs> we sell our paintings on our sale table for ridiculously cheap. So if you're in Denver and you're looking for some original art, come on in, check out our sale table. We sell them for peanuts, for the cost of our paint basically. Two for 25, ridiculous. Um, and then sometimes people come in, they buy them, they put their own initials in, and then they, they tell their friends they did it, and that's all right, we can keep secrets. Okay, so I'm going to spin my brush through some red paint, because red's gonna show up, and I'm gonna put my little John Hancock, my little signature, boop. Oh, that doesn't even show up. I like to use red because I'm a fan of Bob Ross, and he always used red. You can use whatever color you like. Oh, speaking of Bob Ross, we do teach Bob Ross classes here at the studio. Uh, those are oil painting classes and they're longer. So during COVID, uh, during the pandemic, I'm not doing them, but when things start to get a little more back to normal, we're gonna start doing those in the studio again. And those are six hours long, but they're worth it. And they cost a little more too, they're worth it. Because you come home with a beautiful oil painting. 
and learn a ton of skills. All right, so that's my painting. Not exactly a carbon copy of the original, but I'd say pretty close. And I, I hope that you enjoyed painting along with me. And I hope you like your painting. Uh, again, it doesn't have to look like mine, but I hope you're happy with yours. And uh, it's been a real pleasure painting with you. I hope you come into the studio and visit me sometime. Uh, we're at I-25 in Hamden in Denver. And we have classes every single day. Uh, they're either in studio, most of them are in studio. We do have Zoom classes, obviously, and uh, we put them on YouTube. We also have uh, fundraisers. You can host a fundraiser here for a nonprofit and earn all kinds of money for your nonprofit. So um, that's, a, that's a great way to earn some money for the nonprofit. And what else do we do? We give gift certificates to schools so that they can sell them at their auctions. And um, when things return back to normal after the pandemic, we're gonna start back with our watercolor workshops as well. Oh, and uh, coming up for the holidays, we're gonna be making some poor painted ornaments. That's gonna be great. So check out our calendar, www.sibianpaintinghamden.com and uh and the the n in it is just the letter n sipping n painting hamden h-a-m-p-d-e-n dot com thanks for painting with me you're the best ciao bye